Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Entrepreneur Encounters. Today, I'm going to interview Lindsay Roddy, the founder of Roddy Medical Inc. Lindsay has a really amazing journey where she started with a great idea based on her experience and her work environment and was able to transform that not only into an amazing product, but to build a business around it. Let's listen to Lindsay. So I am a nurse by background. I've been a nurse for eight years in intensive care and the recovery room when you come out of surgery. The idea for the business started out of a personal experience I had with a patient where a patient almost lost his life. We get patients up very quickly after open heart surgery. And those are the patients that I was working with. And even just a couple hours after surgery, and they can have five to 15 lines coming out of various locations. And so as we were getting this gentleman up with therapy, the line that was holding his life support medication in his neck got caught and pulled out. And he started to deteriorate. We had to bring the doctors in. They rush into the room. We do some interventions. And, and thank goodness he was okay. But I was not after that for, for a while. I started asking questions of my fellow colleagues. What are you doing to prevent something like this from happening? And has this happened to you? And it was frightening how many times people said, oh, yeah, that's happened to me. And we started hearing story after story after story of scary incidences that may or may not have been reported due to time constraints or fear of reporting or whatever the case was. And in the meantime, we were taping things together, medicine cups, tongue depressors. I went to one hospital and they were using incontinence pads rolled up actually as part of their line kit, which is a, seems contrary in the advanced medical space that we live in today. And so that's how Roddy Medical was started with our first product, which we call the Secure Move TLC. Whoa, I told you this was going to be a big one. Look, we've said it before on this program. Problems are often shown up as opportunities. When we see a problem out there that needs to be solved, sometimes that can be an opportunity for a business. This seems like a huge one. People coming out of surgery, significant, important, life-threatening surgeries, and they've got 10, 15 lines coming off of them. Any one of those lines pops out, you're in significant trouble. And it sounds like the tools and resources that were being used are certainly not uniform across platforms, and there is no good tool available. Has this ever happened to you? The surprising answer when something is so common and so troublesome, and everyone's like, oh yeah, that's happened to me too, Warning flag should be going off if you're an entrepreneur. There's an opportunity here to solve a problem. That's not the end of the process, but that certainly should be the first hint that you need to go down this road and do a little more work because if it bugs you and you think you might have a solution and it's affecting other people, that's an opportunity. There's a business in the wings. Importantly for Lindsay and for the patients who are going to benefit from her hard work, just going through that traumatic experience and brushing it off and waking up the next day and moving on was not going to be enough. So let's talk to Lindsay and see what she does next. I was reluctant at the idea of becoming an entrepreneur, but I saw that that was the way that this had to happen in order for this really to have legs and get into the market. I had to do it. Like we had to do it. And so I started gluing things together from the Home Depot and from the hardware store, started drawing things on paint because I'm not an engineer and started to try to think through what this would do. What would this need to do? And that was bolstered by talking to people. I, I cannot emphasize how important it is to continue to talk to people about their problems and not necessarily your solution all the time. Ask them about their problems because you need to solve their problems. So it actually changed very much from the initial drawings and glued together stuff, which my first one was Sculpey and Twist Ties uh, in my oven in this house. This is my home office. And... Um, it's evolved so much since then. Did you catch that? Lindsay was a reluctant entrepreneur. It wasn't that she woke up one day and was just like, huh, I think it'd be kind of cool to start a business. Or growing up, I always used to sell lemonade and then do this. And I always knew from the time that I was like six weeks old that I was going to be a business owner. No. Lindsay knew if she was going to address this problem, she was going to have to be the one to tackle it. After doing a little bit of research, discovering there's no answer here. So what do we do when you're in this type of product-based business, when you're trying to come up with a solution? I have talked to so many entrepreneurs who are like, I got to go out, hire a company to build me a prototype. Please don't. Please don't. I've worked with so many people. They've spent all their money on the one prototype and it has to be thrown out because it doesn't actually meet the needs 
There's not a focus, as Lindsay mentioned, about talk to the customer. Talk to the customer about their problem. Keep talking about their pro problem. Quit talking about your solution. Quit talking about you. Talk about them. Talk to them. Understand them. So Lindsay started with basically Play-Doh and rubber bands in order to figure out what to make. And I've heard from lots of people, oh, no one's going to buy into my idea. Well, you just need enough to get the concept across. In Lindsay's case, if I can come up with a device that could secure all these lines and be able to give better outcomes or honestly reduce horrible negative outcomes from having some of these lines get dislodged, what does that look like? And from that, she can get her feedback, she can get the iterations. And ultimately, they'll go through tens, dozens, maybe hundreds of prototypes before you settle on the one that actually meets all the needs and in her case, ultimately gets FDA approved. Minimum viable product literally means minimum. What do you have in your house right now that you can get it done with? There are a lot of products that started in someone's kitchen, in someone's garage, in someone's basement. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to get the point across for you to be able to get started. So let's listen to what happens next. So we got involved in an accelerator program. I worked with Brent to get coaching. We went through a National Science Foundation Innovation Corps program. I had testimonials of people talking about the problem. We had done some initial prototyping and gotten people involved. The problem was evident, and we knew what requirements we needed to fill to create a solution. And that's when I started to bring on my team in, in 2019, which was a big step because it's a little rough to go it alone. There are quite a few early support structures for small businesses and small business owners that can really help you succeed. Lindsay talked about joining Accelerator. She talked about some programming that was available through some of the connections that she had. Whatever is out there, I want you to consider taking an opportunity to go through it, but you have to be willing to do the work. You have to be willing to do the homework. When you put in that time and energy combined with this expertise that's being poured into you, when you go out and find coaching and you put the steps into action, that's when positive results start going on. So look around where you're at. What opportunities are available for you? What are you saying? No, that's not for me. Maybe next time, maybe next year. Let's let it be today. Let's let it be now so that you can have the success that you need and be accelerated by others investing in you. Let's listen to Lindsay some more as we hear more about the rigorous programming that she went through. The National Science Foundation Corps with Brent too starting with this thing called the business model canvas and mapping out what you think is correct, who you think your customer is going to be, what value are you going to serve to them? What kind of revenue streams are you going to get? How are you going to get money? Who are your partners going to be? Because you can't do it all, right? And then getting the interviews to back that up or not back that up, challenging your assumptions. And we had quite a few assumptions challenged. So National Science Foundation program. Then we went into the Idea Advance Accelerator program, which is a a fantastic Wisconsin program. I cannot, I cannot give it enough praise. They have a wonderful team. It, the stage one comes with a $25,000 grant and the National Science Foundation interviews helped us prep to apply for this. And what that did is it continued to flush out these interviews. So we've done over three years, about 300 interviews or so. And then after that, they asked the difficult question, like, awesome, you've gotten these interviews. Fantastic. You've nailed it. Safety is an issue. Go quantify that for me. Get me a dollar sign behind that. Their voice challenging our assumptions was so critical. And we actually went and collected some data at multiple hospitals, just timing how long things took with all of these lines, tubes, and cords to get people up and moving, because that's a very big value to organizations these days. And we were able to put a dollar sign on it, which then stepwise got us to where we are now with getting some investment funds. I love this. And if you missed it, I want to repeat it again, putting some dollar signs around the value that you're providing. Just being able to solve the problem doesn't actually mean that someone's willing to pay for it or that you know how much is going to pay for it. Lindsay mentioned they went back into the hospital settings to be able to measure, objectively measure, how much time does it take to achieve this? understanding what are the actual goals they're being measured against. This is one of the biggest challenges I see from entrepreneurs when you're pitching ideas. We have a sort of higher societal goal that this particular product or service is going to meet. However, your customer, maybe it's an organization, maybe it's an individual, that doesn't really matter, but your customer has particular goals 
that they need to reach. So you need to make sure you're aligned with what's important to the person who's actually paying you, which is the customer. So be willing to figure out what's measurable. How do you put some dollars behind it and understand what people are willing to pay for it? We have to focus on value. Value is not what we think it is. Value is in the eyes of our customer. What value is our customer getting from it? But when you can start to put some dollars behind it, you can say, huh, every time this event happens, it costs you this much money. That's going to give you an idea of what it's worth to them, what its value is. We talk about this a lot as Milwaukee Small Business Coach, and I can't touch on it enough. Your product or widget isn't the cost of manufacturing it plus something. Because your costs can change, you really need to figure out what's the value to my end consumer, and then start doing the analysis and figure out not only how you should price it, is this a market that you go into? Does it have the margin that you need? So Lindsay's got a great idea. She's doing some research. She's being accepted to these programs. She's getting some funding to be able to help support continued revisions and getting better and doing the research and understanding it. So let's hear what she did next. So we went to conferences and just say, hey, I would like your insight. You're asking for their advice. You're asking for their insight. And that people are usually much more willing to help you than you would think they would be. So it started with those. We actually mapped out who are people that deal with this problem all the time. And that's where we targeted first the end user. And then it expanded out to others. And it's your network. If you create the right personalized message that's short and sweet and is asking for their advice, you're not asking to sell them. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I would actually put that in my emails or my LinkedIn messages. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I would like 15 minutes to ask you three questions. And people, again, are more willing to help you than you would think. But networking, going to conferences, finding the people, where are the customers? Where are they? Go to what they go to and just even just sit around and ask, ask about them, ask, ask questions about their frustrations. People like to share what they're frustrated about. So how do you go and talk about your product and get feedback for your product and understand where you're at without everyone running for the hills and be like, oh, they're going to sell something. I don't want to talk to a salesperson and all that. I love what Lindsay said. Two things to remember. These are true. These are true. You need to delete whatever nonsense is playing in your head and remember this. People are more happy to help than you think. Not everyone, but as a general rule, people are more happy to help you than you think and lead off with this is not a sales call. I am not going to sell you anything. I am calling because I want to learn some information. I want to ask you some questions. I want to understand how you run your business, how you might use this product, what happens in your life. I am doing research right now. I'm doing research. And then maintain your commitment. Don't sort of like sideways sneak in a selling thing. And then go work your network. Boil down your message to something clear and concise. One of the things I love to do at Milwaukee Small Business Coach is help people tell their story with impact. A lot of us can tell a story, but it doesn't have impact. When you put your story clean and concise, as Lindsay laid out for us, you can start to have impact. And you can start to get the feedback, you can get the information, you can get the buy-in that you're really looking for. So let's listen to what happens next. I would say pricing was another thing that my mind was kind of over here on. And multiple people through coaching just said, you need to think bigger, test the price point. And I'm so glad we did because in my mind, this needed to be a much lower price item. I'm just thinking of what I pull off the wall as a nurse. Then when I started finding out about what the prices were, I thought, holy cow, that's crazy. Do we really pay that much for these things? Yes, we do. Well, let's rethink how we're pricing this. We upped the price for our financial model. And then when we actually went out and started talking to people who could be decision makers, we tested a higher price point and it wasn't a problem. There wasn't, which it was kind of like, wow, that surprised me a lot but we're very excited about it. I remember my early coaching sessions with Lindsay. I had to encourage her to add a zero. What do I mean by that? Sometimes when we're looking at pricing, we are scared to charge our value. We've already talked about establishing value for what it's worth for others and how to ask those questions. But sometimes we're charging $5 and we ought to be charging 50. Sometimes we're charging 50 when we need to charge 500. Sometimes we're charging 500 when it needs to be 5,000. The zero isn't just limited to price either. Oftentimes when we're raising money, when we're looking at how much funding, we get a little bit scared and we're like, well, if I ask for too much money, no one will fund me. So I'm going to ask for just a little bit of money. Well, sometimes that's not helpful. I want us to think 
bigger. Think bigger than where we're at. Can you use $100,000? Is it a million dollars? What does it actually take to make this successful? Rolling out a product like Lindsay is talking about is not a, it's not a giant dollar venture, but it's also not a small dollar venture. Think bigger, add that zero on there. What in your business should you be sticking a zero on in order to start making the progress that you need to make? Because that's how we end up turning hard work into hard cash. Well, just like you, I can't do this all by myself. There are lots of other people who pour in me in order to make this happen. Two I want to highlight right now, Kate half Lawson for doing a lot of the editing and work that it takes to be able to get it in a format that you're listening to now, and Chris Crane for doing our music, both on the intro and the outro. And as always, we have a lot of additional content you can find on our website at mkebusinesscoach.com, or you can follow us on our video and podcast platforms. If you like what you're hearing today, I want to encourage you to like it, share it, and please subscribe to stay in touch. So again, thank you for joining me on this episode of Entrepreneur Encounters. I'm Brent half Milwaukee Small Business Coach, and I want to invite Chris to take us out. Ready to take